Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Landmark Chambers webinar. We're going to discuss uh, development plan issues this morning, and we're delighted to see that so many of you have joined the session today. Uh, we hope that you will find the presentations and the discussions useful. My name is Neil Cameron. I'm going to chair the session today, and I'm going to be joined by my colleagues, Stephen Morgan, who will speak on the implications of the current public health restrictions. Uh, James Neal, who will speak on neighborhood plans. Andrew Parkinson, who will consider the policy test for altering uh, greenbelt boundaries. And Kate Olley, who's going to discuss assessing housing need. Now, before we begin, just a few housekeeping points to note. Your microphones are automatically muted, so you will not need to adjust your local settings. You're very welcome to ask questions. And if you'd like to ask questions, please use the Q&A function, which will be found probably at the bottom of your screen. Uh, what we're going to do is to hear all the presentations and then deal with questions and answers at the end. But you can ask your questions whenever you like uh, during the seminar. The webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link to the presentation and the recording shortly after the event concludes. If at any time during the webinar uh, your connection is lost, we invite you to rejoin the meeting and you use the same means as you used in the first place. You click on the original link again. So turning from those housekeeping matters to uh, the subject matter, the first speaker is Stephen Morgan. There are few barristers with greater experience of the local plan system, advising and representing local planning authorities, developers and others. And I look forward to hearing what Stephen is going to tell us about progressing plans in a COVID-19 world. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Neil. I hope, I know it's rather um, unnecessary to ask you all because you can't answer, but I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. And I'd like to echo Neil's welcome and thank you all for um, logging in. And I hope you're going to find this of some interest. Um, I will kick off the quartet of short presentations by highlighting some of the key issues that are arising in relation to plan making as a result, as, as Neil said, of the public health situation. Uh, and these, of course, as you will know, arise from restrictions on movement of gatherings, and you'll be familiar with the regulations that have been amended now three times, I'll call them for short, the restrictions regulations. And in essence, we're talking about, at the moment, no face-to-face -face events. Uh, and as you will know, um, physical events, face-to-face -face events are, are currently suspended by, pan, by PINs. Um, with regard to the development plan process though, uh, I, I, there are both of course implications in the substantive sense in terms of the evidence base and the procedural sense uh, and you have to have regard to the examination stage and the preparation stage. Forgive me, difficulty changing the slide. Um, but those problems need to be just set the context, if I may. Um, as you know, PINs originally cancelled all physical events, including local plan examinations, and that was one of the main concerns. And that has to be seen in the context of, of the pressure for getting uh, up to date 
MPPF compliant plans in place by the end of December 23. You'll be familiar with the Secretary of State making that point in planning for the future. How realistic that will remain, we'll, we will see. Um, and the other context, of course, is, is the desperate need for housing and, and the stalling of constructions and so on, which, which you will be well familiar with, uh, and concerns over housing land supply and the implications for local authorities and indeed, of course, the development industry. And just we'll mention what, one interesting survey from the RTPI, I think over a thousand of their 25,000 members, private and public, um, for those who are interested, might be worth looking at, but they express the desire to maintain um, momentum to the process, although they had uncertainty about uh, using remote examinations. They also also had uncertainty about the evidence base. So there, there's in essence that the, the uh, problems in terms of solutions, um, the first push was to keep examinations moving forward and using virtual events has been, as you will be aware, much encouraged by the government. And in particular, uh, the 13th of May was a very busy day for producing all sorts of documents, but in, in, including Mr. Jenrick's um, ministerial statement uh, and new planning policy guidance covering both local plans and neighbourhood development plans. And also on that day, PINs um, produced a statement um, referring to the ministerial statement, explaining how they were working with local authorities. A and more recently, last Thursday, uh, PINs updated that, saying they had one local plan hearing going to take place via phone and conference, and one full local plan examination to be conducted virtually in July. Um, worth pausing there for a moment and you might think of course that virtual events are going to be a, a temporary um, phenomenon to help us through the current situation but it is to be noted that in their document of last week which i just referred to they, they actually say we are learning from each event with the aim of making virtual events our standard option for the majority of events in future and you can see i've emphasized that on the slide uh, and that includes planning appeals, national infrastructure, and for our purposes, of course, local plans. Um, interesting point, really, how far you go with that. It's also just worth mentioning that also in that document, while having said that, they do recognise it's not the end of face-to-face -face hearings and inquiries, and they'll continue in the future. But how far they will is open to discussion. It may be something we can come back to at the end of our talks. But you, point to note here is section 20 subsection 6 of the 2004 Act does provide that any person who makes representations seeking to change a development plan document must, if they request, be given the opportunity to appear before and be heard by the person carrying out the examination. Um, question, is a video uh, method, digital method, sufficient to satisfy that statutory requirement? We may come back to that. But even if you can carry out the examinations in an acceptable and fair way, and fairness is key, of course, um, even if you can do that, then there still um, are solutions required for being able to carry out consultation fairly and fully and, and meet with the 2012 regulations. But there are two particular legal obstacles that I'm meeting in practice and others are. And I'd just like to deal with those if I might, just worth highlighting. Firstly, section 19.3 of the 2004 Act, again, um, requires that when you're preparing local development documents, um, including, of course, the local plan, you must comply with the statement of community involvement. Um, and in reality, those statements often require documents to be made available at council offices, local libraries, etc. In other words, face-to-face -face, uh, physical events, which of course are problematic at the moment. Uh, and that was uh, a problem which the Planning Advisory Service gave useful uh, help on, but the government issued uh, an updated PPG on the 13th of May, that busy day for new advice. Uh, and worth noting in that, um, that it encourages local authorities to beat this problem it's encouraging um, you to um, immediately review and update 
the policies where they would conflict, like I just mentioned, if you have to deposit the documents in um, libraries and so on, where they would conflict with that. So that they're encouraged to do that, and I know local authorities are doing that to ensure that they that the procedures set out for consultation can meet with the current stay at home um, preferences, guidance and regulations. And it's to be noted that there's no statutory requirement for consultation, but where a planning authority has made a pledge in their statement of community involvement to consult on any changes that they, the guidance tells us, may wish to take independent legal advice on how West best to proceed. And indeed, they would be best advised to do that. Uh, and if I may say, councils need to watch as well whether they've made statements elsewhere in other documents um, indicating they would do, do such consultation and need to be careful but that doesn't cause them a difficulty um, or a challenge. That was the first legal requirement. The second hotspot, um, which has to some degree been overlooked, or, or again, uh, the planning advisory service do, do pick it up helpfully, but that's compliance with regulation 35 of the local planning regulations, which those involved in processing the plan will be familiar with. Uh, and that requires that documents need to be made available by a planning authority, um, and in essence, as you will see from 35.1, at their principal office and at such other places within their area as the planning authority consider appropriate. So the various requirements that there are under the regulations, um, some relate to the end of the process when you put, for example, the SCI, the Statement of Community Involvement, um, when it's adopted on deposit, you have to comply with 35 likewise with the local plan, but there's some like under regulation 22, the publication plan and regulation, regulation 19, sorry, the publication plan and regulation 22 submission to the Secretary of State that have to be done during the process. So they will, that is a problem that has to be faced if you're still at the stage where you can't physically deposit it at the council offices. So I hope that gives you a, a quick highlights and the hot spots in local plans. Turning to neighbourhood plans, the first point to make is that helpfully in the procedural sense, the requirements regarding publicity, consultation, availability aren't as strict under the 2012 Neighbourhood Planning General Regulations. Um, you will be aware that uh, neighbourhood plan referendums have been suspended, as I set out there in the first bullet point, uh, and, and can't take place before the 5th of May 2021. I should also point out that um, notwithstanding that, they are still to be given significant weight where they've been through all the other stages and they're at the stage where the council has, has found that they're ready to be put to the referendum. So they will get significant weight then. Um, with regard to examinations, the general rule remains that examinations should be conducted by written representation. So there isn't that difficulty. Um, at all, but the, it, you are advised that wherever possible, oral, representa oral representations may still take place using video conferencing or similar. Uh, and finally, public participation in terms of uh, neighbourhood planning. Then again, there's no requirement that it's undertaken using face-to-face -face methods. Um, but what you have to do, the regulations require, has to be done in a manner likely to bring it to the attention of those living and working and carrying out business in the neighbourhood area. So that gives more flexibility, more discretion to the authority, and they have more discretion on where documents have to be put for inspection. James will deal with the substantive matters on neighbourhood plans, but that gives you just a, an insight into the current difficulties or implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. So can I then just turn to, to two final matters? I, I focus there on procedural matters in relation to local plans, neighbourhood plans, but of course, um, you can't lose sight of the fact that there are gonna be potentially a whole range of issues over which there's currently much uncertainty which will impact on the evidence base. Um, many of you will be familiar with these, but viability given the recession, changes in how people can or are willing to travel, um, to work, holiday, take leisure, etc. And, and working from home, look at us all, um, you know, what impact is that gonna have on the, both the transport network and the, you know, one anticipates a decline of office demand and implications of those, what will we use with 
properties vacated and so on. There are also, of course, the implications for the housing delivery test in the five years housing, housing land supply in England, if housing completions stall for a period of time. And another very important matter are retail trends. I mean, the high street, as you will all know, was already in decline and, and seeking to change and, and add attractions. But what now is there for pl planning for less demand for floor space and what you do with the existing empty floor space? And so there are real issues in terms of the um, evidence base and, of course, e even gathering that evidence base in, in uh, procedural and practical terms. And finally, just, just to round this off, you can't escape the fact that there are already um, some, to some degree, changes in the offing, but there's a broader context uh, and the, the pandemic and the responses to it and implications that will flow um, combined, combined with current issues and trends. I mean, they are likely to influence the planning system, including the development plan regime, no doubt in ways that we can't really anticipate. Um, virtual examinations um, look as though they well may become part and parcel of the system. Um, housing need, who, who quite knows where we go with that. Kate will deal with more substantive aspects of that, but there's clearly aspects of that that are even less certain than usual. Uh, and in terms of need, given the pressure for need, you may have seen assessment of new town settlements. Um, there's some pressure to take those out of local plans following the inspector in North Essex local plan, whether anyone saw that, but um, where he effectively did recommended against two of the three suggested new gargoyle settlements. And it's being suggested they could be taken out. That's been dealt with the development consent system. So there could be big changes for the local plan system. And finally, one of the major changes, because there's implications for cost and delay, as much criticism of the plan system from all sides. And of course, the policy exchange is rethinking the planning system. That's very critical of the existing planning system, in particular, the um, plans as well, spending an average of two and a half million producing a local plan, it says, for a local authority, and one million pounds of which is spent on average on the evidence base. They also refer to the time a lot of authorities taking up to seven years to produce a plan. So with the cost implications of the pandemic and the other implications and concerns and need to facilitate development, you know, we could well see a major change in the plan system. Thank you for listening. I uh, hope that was of some interest. I will now pass over to James, who will deal with neighbourhood plans. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Stephen. So I'm going to be uh, speaking about key issues in relation to um, neighbourhood plans. Um, I'm going to do so in the context of what is clearly an increasing importance of uh, local plans in the uh, planning system. I'm going to look briefly at why that is. And then um, I'll touch on at the end, um, if I've got a bit of time with, I'll touch on a couple of recent legal challenges to neighbourhood plans, both of which were unsuccessful, um, and, and look at what lessons, if any, can be drawn from uh, those legal challenges. The, so um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about neighbourhood plans, so I'm just going to move to um, the, my first uh, slide. And this really comes, this is my sort of primary point of my presentation, which is the increasing importance of the growth in neighbourhood plan um, coverage uh, nationally. The, this slide I've taken from um, all things neighbourhood planning's website, but I, uh, I hope you can see along the bottom, it, it shows the number of uh, neighbourhood plans by referendum date um, that have um, been, uh, that have passed referendums, so which have been through examination and then moved to, um, uh, and then moved to, moved to referendums. The, the key point here is that you'll see by 2020, uh, and this was, February 2020, a total of a thousand plans, of, uh, neighbourhood plans have been adopted. Um, and that, if, if one understands that in the context of the government, when introducing neighbourhood plans in uh, 2011, uh, stated that it, it thought that there would be possibly the, or the opportunity to introduce at least 8,000 uh, neighbourhood plans. So the coverage is, is increasing, if not exponentially, but certainly 
at quite a fast rate. The, um, on average at the moment, based on figures from last year, there were um, at least, it, the, the rate of plans being, um, being adopted was reaching something in the order of 20, um, 20 plans per month. Um, another interesting statistic is that certainly towards the end of last year, at least 165 local planning authorities had at least one neighborhood plan adopted in its area. And um, a further statistic from, uh, the, from DCRG suggests that of the referendums carried out, 87% carry a yes vote. So they're clearly um, hugely popular where they are advanced uh, by qualifying bodies. They, are clearly, they clearly attract a huge amount of popularity. Um, so we've seen the, the importance in terms of geographical coverage of, of neighborhood plans and the increasing importance of them. Um, but why are they so critical in the um, planning system? And I've already summarized this on this slide in, in, in two respects. First of all, they've given a clear policy preference over local plans, and that's clear um, from paragraph 30 of the, the MPPF, and I've, I've, set, I've set out on the slide uh, the extract. So um, that makes it clear that um, once a neighbourhood plan has been brought into force, the policies, the policies it contains takes preference over existing non-strategic policies in the local plan covering neighbourhood area where they're in conflict. There's also legal pre precedents afforded to um, neighbourhood plans, of course, by section 38.5 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act, um, which states that where there is a conflict between a neighbourhood plan and policy in a uh, local plan or spatial development strategy, the conflict must be resolved in favour of the policy which is contained in the last document to become part of the development plan. And that's crucial and it's created in effect a little bit of a, um, an arms race or certainly a, a race to be first to the post between um, emerging neighbourhood plans and, and local plans. And we'll explore that in a bit when we come to the a recent legal um, challenge um, determined in May, the Lock Island case. So when looking at, um, just trying to move to the, the next slide. So um, just looking at a little bit more detail at um, the, the importance of neighbourhood neighbor plans, where they actually, um, and how they fit into the policy context. A little bit more detail here, just by way of a reminder. Um, neighbourhood plans can, of course, allocate housing sites, and they can, so they can even allocate alternative sites to those in a local plan. And that's set out, I put that up on the extract of the PPG. Um, critically, they, um, they can also include policies um, and housing allocation policies, even when there is, no, um, there is no development plan setting out strategic policies for housing. And there was a, a spate of litigation between 2014 and 2017, where um, the courts were being asked to consider what do you do where um, there is an out-of-date local plan? Can, can a neighbourhood plan even pass the test of conformity with uh, strategic policies if there are no strategic policies and um, the courts confirmed um, in the, uh, the Mr. Uh, Lord Justice Limbaugh confirmed in DLA delivery that the test that applies to neighborhood plans in general conformity with strategic policies really means if there are if there are relevant strategic policies um, the, the, then the neighborhood plan must not be otherwise in conformity with them. But if there are none, then neighborhood plans can still progress. And then finally, just touching on the importance of neighborhood plans, uh, the, of course, very important when it comes to looking at circumstances where there is no five-year housing land supply um, and where the tilted balance under paragraph 11 applies. Well, of course, um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, um, MP, the paragraph 14 of the MPPF, which effectively rocks the tilted balance back in 
has become was adopted two years or less before the uh, development management decision was going to be made, and where the um, neighbourhood plan contains policies and allocations to meet its identified housing requirement. So that, that sets the context to, um, the, uh, to, to, to the importance of neighbourhood plans. But that sets the policy context. But the situation is made even more complicated, and some people would say even more unsatisfactory. In circumstances where you have neighbourhood plans given this legal and policy preference, it seems odd that the test for adoption of those plans, which are arguably more critical even than local plans, it seems odd that in statute, the test for, the, for their adoption and the bar for their adoption is even lower than local plans. And then again, by way of reminder, I've set out the, uh, the basic conditions that, for conformity that neighbourhood plans have to meet. And I, I won't repeat um, all of them, but um, you'll see there no mention of the test of soundness or the question of evidence and proportionality of that evidence. But of course, you see um, in the MPPF when looking at the test of soundness. So, um, just looking in a bit more detail, what that low bar for, for neighbourhood plans to pass examination really means? Well, it's clear that the degree of scrutiny examination is um, relatively limited, and that's made absolutely clear by for cases, for example, Woodcock Holdings and Mr. Justice Holgate's um, comments there. The the courts have emphasised that the question of whether there's general conformity with a local plan is a matter of planning judgment. That's not for the court to decide, see DLA delivery. The, it's clear that the issue is whether the neighbourhood plan as a whole complies with the local plan as a whole, not whether uh, individual policies conflict with individual policies in the local plan. Um, and at least on the face of it, there's no need to consider whether a draft policy is supported by a proportionate evidence base. Now, just pausing there, of course, that doesn't mean you don't have to justify the plan, but what um, that means is that the, the, the proportionate evidence base requirements um, under the MPPF for soundness doesn't apply. The MPPG planning guidance on neighbourhood plans certainly talks about the need for um, proportionate evidence. But that's all in the context of, of meeting the, um, the, the, the general conformity tests. So it's not identical and it, seems, and, and it seems to be a looser test in terms of justifying uh, particular choices in, the, um, in, in neighbourhood plans. So, um, so that, that sets the context of the case that I, I, I want to um, finish my presentation talking about, which is um, the case of Lock Island Investments and Mendit District Council. And that, that case focused on what seems to be a very live topic at the moment, which is the tension between the evidence being prepared and the decisions being made by local plan inspectors in relation to emerging local plans and um, the conclusions of examiners of, of neighbourhood plans. Because of course, um, one of the um, peculiarities of the system, which um, in, in theory want, wants neighbourhood plans to be in general conformity with local plans, is of course there's nothing to stop neighbourhood plans proceeding at the same time as, and indeed before, uh, local plans and those strategic policies are brought forward. And that creates some very, um, some very bizarre and um, some very bizarre outcomes. And Lock Island really illustrates this. So the, in July 2019, the neighbourhood plan examiner decided that designating 10 sites as local green space met, met the basic conditions. Now, just pausing there, local green space is um, effectively a weaponized issue when it comes to neighborhood plans. I look back in some statistics and in September 2019, for example, the majority of adopted neighborhood plans all were using local green space to afford policy protection to open space. So it's a, it's a very, very live issue with, with neighborhood plans. Concurrently, 
um, to the progression of the neighbourhood plans, the local plan inspector um, said that the overall, uh, in September 2019, um, indicated in a, um, an interim report that the overall approach in the local plan to some of the same um, LGS uh, was unsound and didn't meet that high bar in national policy regarding justification. Um, now, the, the challenge was brought on the basis that the, the neighbourhood plan examination, the examiner um, decision was effectively irrational. And one of the arguments used was, well, look what the local plan inspector said. And the, the, unfortunate, um, the, the unfortunate point about this case was timing. On the 2nd of the December, the 2nd of September, the decision was taken to um, accept the report into the neighbourhood plan and proceed to referendum. But then eight days later, um, the local plan inspector issued an interim report recommending deletion of all these LDSs. So it was only eight days later. There was no synchronisation of those two different processes being carried out, um, being carried on. And um, Mrs Justice Land dismissed this challenge on the basis that the, and she made clear that the examination of the neighbourhood plan was independent of the local plan process. And because of that post-dating um, of the uh, local plan inspector's note after the examiner's report, um, it was not a matter that could have been taken into account by the council eight days earlier when um, proceeding to accept the examiner's uh, recommendations. And she said effectively at best the local plan inspector's views were just one other view of a, um, of a planning professional and expert, and they were only relevant to the rationality challenge to the examiner's decision, that the LGS decisions were inappropriate. And she emphasised, um, and she placed a great deal of emphasis on the different statutory tasks of a neighbourhood plan examiner um, as compared to a local plan inspector. So, um, a pretty unsatisfactory decision when from the inspectorate you're getting two um, inspectors almost at the same time coming to pretty diametric, diametrically opposed um, views but in those circumstances because of the looser test to pass um, neighbourhood plans they were able to proceed. One final case and it's again a Mrs Justice Lang decision, Wilbur Development and Hart District Council is worth taking a look at. Um, again a similar, pro a similar um, problem to do with coalescence and settlement gaps between, between villages and um, conflicting conclusions by a local plan inspector um, being proceeding at the same time as a local plan examination and uh, as a neighbourhood plan examination and again that challenge was um, unsuccessful um, for, for many of the same reasons that um, Mrs Justice Lang referred to in Lock Island. So um, thank you very much for listening. I'm now going to pass you over to my colleague, Andrew Parkinson, who's going to talk about Greenbelt and exceptional circumstances. Thank you, James, and good morning, everyone. I'm gonna be talking about the Greenbelt and exceptional circumstances. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by briefly going through the policy context, and then I'm gonna look at the implications of the recent High Court decision in the Compton case on what can amount to exceptional circumstances. So I'll start with the um, policy framework and that's um, of course set out at paragraphs 136 to 139 of the MPPF. And paragraph 136 sets out the um, familiar and well-known text. Once established, Greenbelt boundaries should only be altered where exceptional circumstances are fully evidenced and justified through the preparation or updating of plans. So the need for change has to be established through strategic policies, so through local plan, but detailed amendments to the boundaries can be made through non-strategic policies, and that includes neighbourhood plans. There's no definition of exceptional circumstances, and in the Calverton case, it was said that this was a deliberate policy choice to leave the definition broad and undefined. However, the 2019 version of the MPPF does add quite a bit more detail on when exceptional circumstances are likely to be demonstrated. And in particular, it added a new paragraph, paragraph 137, which is important. 
and that required local planning authorities to examine fully other reasonable options for meeting its identified need for development. And in doing so, it formalised the requirement that was first referred to in the Housing White Paper in February 2017. And three factors in particular need to be assessed and looked at in terms of other options. The first is the availability of suitable brownfield sites or underutilised land. The second is the optimisation of density standards, particularly, but not exclusively, in town and city centres. And the third is the possibilities for neighbouring authorities to accommodate some of the identified need through the duty to cooperate. But the reality is that examination, there's likely to be a broader examination of the wider potential for development on non-greenbelt land. Um, and testing of this option will be required through the sustainability appraisal against social, economic and environmental objectives. I think it's important though to remember that any such exercise needs to take into account the overarching requirements of the MPPF and also the Greenbelt section in terms of promoting sustainable patterns of development. And we can see that there in paragraph 138 of the MPPF. For example, um, it would be necessary for local planning authorities to consider what would be the impact of increased development on villages beyond the Greenbelt that may be in unsustainable locations. And we can see that, for example, as part of the justification for Greenbelt release in the Sunderland plan, where the inspector found that the release of non-Greenbelt land would lead to the loss of identity of settlements, the eroding of settlement breaks, and would put extra burdens on infrastructure. And then finally, and again linked to this, paragraph 138 of the MPPF also makes clear that once it has been considered that there are exceptional circumstances and Greenbelt release is necessary, plans should give first consideration to land which has been previously developed and or is well served by public transport. Paragraph 139 of the MPPF sets out further detailed requirements and these largely do reflect the language um, of the 2012 MPPF at paragraph 85. So there'll be a need to ensure that any um, new boundaries are consistent with the development plan strategy for meeting identified requirements for sustainable development, identifying areas of safeguarded land when necessary, and demonstrating that Greenbelt boundaries will not need to be altered at the end of the plan period. And then finally, I think it's important to read this entire section in the, the context of paragraph 11b of the MPPF, which of course, um, similar text used to be found in paragraph 14 of the 2012 MPPF, um, which says that strategic policy should as a minimum provide for objectively assessed needs for housing and other uses, as well as any needs that cannot be met within neighbouring areas. Unless, one, the application of policies in this framework that protect areas or assets of particular importance, and of course, that includes the Greenbelt, provides a strong reason for restricting the overall scale, type or distribution of development in the plan area, or two, any adverse effects of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when assessed against the policies and the framework taken as a whole. So there is scope not to meet the objectively assessed need at the policy on stage if either of the circumstances in paragraph B apply. So for example, the um, Seven Oaks plan um, proposed to do that, um, not meet its objectively assessed need. That's a district that's of course heavily constrained by Greenbelt um, and they relied on paragraph 11b1. Now that plan, um, as most people probably know, didn't pass through um, the duty to cooperate. There's a legal challenge to that decision, which I understand permission was granted on um, this week. So that's something to, to watch going forward. So with that by way of overall context, I'll turn to the uh, relatively recent decision of Sir Duncan Oosley in the Compton case, which was handed down in December last year. This was a statutory challenge to the Guildford Borough Local Plan. It's worth noting that that plan was examined under the 2012 MPPF, but in my view, most if not all of the comments made in the judgment about whether a particular factor is capable of amounting to exceptional circumstances would also apply under the 2019 MPPF. And the main issue in the case was whether the local plan inspector had erred in law in concluding that exceptional circumstances um, existed to justify Greenbelt release. And that was in the context where the objectively assessed need for the district was, uh, for the borough, was 10,678 dwellings. The provision was made for more than this so for 14,602 dwellings, and that included 
um, 6,295 homes in the Greenbelt. So there was a 36% buffer um, against potential slippages or under delivery or 36% over provision um, of housing, depending on your viewpoint. I think it is worth though remembering that in this case, that still only amounted to about one and a half percent of um, the green belt um, being released. So the inspector, the local plan inspector found that exceptional circumstances existed and he relied on a number of reasons uh, for that, both at the strategic level and also for each of the uh, green belt sites to be released, which included three strategic allocations. So the first was the integrated nature of the proposals. For example, one of the allocated Greenbelt sites, Gosden Hill, who I represented in the High Court, formed part of a wider sustainable movement corridor, which couldn't have come forward without that site. And there were other um, interdependencies and linkages between the different allocations in the Greenbelt. The second is the importance of a headroom in case of slippage, and I'll come back to that. Um, pressing housing need, very serious shortfall in the provision of affordable housing, meeting Woking's unmet need, the contribution of sites to infrastructure and other benefits, the sustainability of the chosen locations and the contribution to a balanced spatial strategy, and the lack of any adverse impact on openness and the purposes of the Green Belt. So the claim was made, there were a number of grounds, but for the purposes of um, this talk, the um, main ground of challenge was on the basis that exceptional circumstances cannot exist where more land is released from the green belt than is necessary to meet the objectively assessed need. And in any event, it was said that the inspector had not considered the scope for meeting some of the need, um, rather than all of the need, in accordance with paragraph 14 of the MPPF. So in terms of the key takeaways from the Compton judgment, the claim was dismissed. Um, I would say it's probably not surprising in light of the careful, wide ranging and, and detailed explanation of the uh, exceptional circumstances set out by the inspector. But in dismissing the claim, Sir Duncan Oosley relied heavily on the fact that the concept of exceptional circumstances is left deliberately undefined. And that led him to conclude that in, in reality, inspectors have an almost unfettered discretion as to whether or not exceptional circumstances exist, subject only to um, that judgment not being irrational. But there are as well useful indications from the judgment on what is not necessary to demonstrate exceptional circumstances. So first point that I get out of the judgment is exceptional circumstances don't need to be extraordinary. And in fact, the test is less demanding than the very special circumstances test that applies for individual planning applications at the um, development consent stage. And in finding that, um, the case confirms the approach that was taken in the Luton case. Second, there's no requirement that Greenbelt land be released as a last resort. All that's required is that the circumstances relied on taken together rationally fit within the scope of exceptional circumstances. And again, that confirms the approach that was taken previously in the IM properties case. Although I would add a note of caution there because of course, as a matter of policy, um, there is the requirement that I set out earlier to consider the other potential options set out a paragraph 137 of the MPPF. But as a matter of law, Greenbelt release shouldn't be seen as necessarily having to be a last resort. Third, there's, there's no need for there to be more than one exceptional circumstance. Um, but at the same time, exceptional circumstances can be found in the accumulation or combination of circumstances of varied natures. And those circumstances don't need to be unlikely to occur elsewhere. And then fourth, um, exceptional circumstances can include general planning matters. So for example, the need for ordinary housing is not excluded from the scope of exceptional circumstances. And that does clear up um, some uncertainty that had existed in the previous case law on this point. And in fact, as uh, Duncan Easley said that meeting such needs often is part of the judgment that exceptional circumstances exist. Um, 
it's certainly not irrelevant, and he said can weigh heavily, if not decisively, in the judgment as to what amounts to exceptional circumstances. He also said that um, unmet need, in theory, in of itself, in some cases, could amount to exceptional circumstances. Now, the reason I say in theory is because, again, in, in practice, as a matter of policy, uh, local planning authorities would have to apply paragraphs 137 and 138 of the NPPF and demonstrate that whilst there might be an unmet need, um, that they've looked at whether that need could, need could be met elsewhere um, or satisfied themselves that doing so would result in unsustainable patterns of development. So overall in the case, um, it was found that meeting the objectively assessed need and ensuring a sensible supply buffer were legitimate purposes of Greenbelt release. Once meeting the OAN is accepted as a strategic level factor which can contribute to exceptional circumstances, then it follows that providing a headroom to prevent against any potential slippage in housing delivery also contributes to exceptional circumstances. And therefore there was no error in law in providing for more houses than um, the objectively assessed need um, suggested were required. Um, and that was particularly the case in the Guildford situation, where that buffer, um, so the additional um, provision of homes above the objectively assessed need, was needed to achieve a sustainable pattern of development and also realise strategic site benefits that may not have otherwise come forward. And again, that um, uh, is relying on paragraph 138 of the MPPF. In terms of um, paragraph 14 um, and the policy on stage, Sir Duncan Newsley found that this doesn't need to be considered separately. Um, the policy on stage is necessarily part and parcel of considering whether exceptional circumstances exist, um, but obviously it would be good practice to, to consider it separately and expressly deal with it. So in terms of the practical implications of the case, um, in my view, the case doesn't set out any new law, but I think it provides probably the clearest and certainly the most recent authority on the proper approach to exceptional circumstances. I think it's fairly clear from the judgment that the courts are very unlikely to intervene to override the judgment of local planning authority or an inspector on uh, whether exceptional circumstances exist. So that should give some comfort to local planning authorities that their judgments about Greenbelt release are more likely to um, survive judicial scrutiny. Uh, examination might be a bit more tricky. So I think overall there's, there's very little scope left for bringing a legal challenge on the basis that a particular factor isn't legally capable of amounting to exceptional circumstances. The only ground left is the rationality and that's a very high threshold. I think it's also worth noting that in the course of the judgment, it was emphasised that national planning policy requires not simply planning for new homes, but the actual delivery of those homes. And in this case, that justified a buffer against under delivery, um, and in other cases can justify a housing requirement above the OAN. The two-stage approach that one sees in examinations was also endorsed i.e. identifying both strategic level exceptional circumstances, such as a district-wide unmet need, but also local level exceptional circumstances to justify the particular boundary changes. For example, the site-specific benefits of a particular site or the particular contribution that that site makes to the green belt. Um, finally, it was said that there's no need to slavishly follow the um, so-called checklist of factors that were set out in the Calverton judgment that have been trotted out um, up and down the country in, in Greenbelt examinations. That's because every plan is different and the circumstances that um, might justify exceptional circumstances in one case don't necessarily apply in another. That said, because lawyers can't resist a, a checklist, Sir Duncan Oosley did then set out um, some factors of his own, which he said would be inevitably relevant when considering exceptional circumstances. And those are at paragraph 72. Um, so he said there would almost inevitably be, inevitably be an, an analysis of the nature and degree of the need allied to consideration of why the need cannot be met in locations which are sequentially preferable for such developments, an analysis of the impact on the functioning of the Greenbelt and its purpose, 
and what other advantages the proposed locations released from the Greenbelt might bring. For example, in terms of a sound spatial distribution strategy. Um, in my view, though, for a local planning authority preparing a plan under the 2019 MPPF, nothing can be systematically going through the relevant paragraphs of the MPPF, ensuring that all reasonable options are being tested for the sustainability appraisal with those facts in mind, and ensuring that an exceptional circumstances case can be justified both on the strategic level and also on the local level for the individual sites concerned. So I'll now um, hand over to Kate Olley, um, who's going to be looking at the question of housing need. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Neil. Uh, let's start with a quick tour around the PPG in case that's helpful for some. So as spelled out in the MPPG, housing needs the unconstrained assessment of the number of homes needed in an area, and assessing this is the first step in the process of deciding how many homes need to be planned for. It needs to be calculated at the start of the plan making process, but kept under review and revised where appropriate. And the NPPF, of course, expects strategic policy making authorities to follow the standard method formula for assessing housing need. And the standard method uses a formula to identify the minimum number of homes expected to be planned for in a way which addresses projected housing growth and historic undersupply. And if you'll forgive me, just to go over the, the three steps of the formula, and again, in case that's helpful for some. Uh, first, uh, setting the baseline using national household growth projections, which in England is the 2014 base projections, uh, and then to calculate the projected annual household growth over a 10 year period. Why the 2014 based household projections? Well, I quote, that's to provide stability for planning authorities and communities, ensure that historic under delivery and declining affordability are reflected and to be consistent with the government's objective of significantly boosting the supply of homes. And it's stated in terms that any method which relies on using the 2016 based household projections will not be considered to be following the standard method as set out in paragraph 60 of the NPPF. It's not considered that these projections provide an appropriate base for use in the standard method. Step two, to adjust the average annual projected figure based on the affordability of the area, because household growth is not on its own a sufficient indicator of future housing need. Household formation uh, is constrained by the supply of available properties and new ones can't form if there's nowhere for them to live that's affordable. And then finally, step three, to apply the cap which limits the increases that an individual authority can face so that the figure that the standard method produces is kept as deliverable as possible and how the cap's calculated depends on the current status of the relevant strategic policies for housing. And because it simply reduces the minimum number generated by the method, but not the housing need itself, uh, the strategic policies adopted with a cap applied may need an early review and updating in order to ensure that that unmet need above the capped level is planned for as soon as possible. Using the standard method isn't mandatory, but if authorities feel that circumstances warrant an alternative approach, they can expect this to be scrutinized more closely at examination. So there's an expectation that the standard method will be used and that any other method will only be used in exceptional circumstances. So when might it be appropriate to plan for a higher housing need figure than the standard method indicates? Ambitious authorities who want to plan for growth are supported by the government because the standard method is just a minimum starting point. Uh, circumstances where it might be appropriate to consider whether the need is higher than the standard method indicates include situations where increases in need are likely to exceed past trends due to growth strategies for the area that are likely to be deliverable, uh, strategic infrastructure improvements that are likely to drive an increase in the number of homes needed locally, and where the authority has agreed, as set out in a statement of common ground, to take on unmet need from neighbouring authorities. Uh, where an alternative approach results in a lower housing need figure than that identified using the standard method, 
the strategic policy making authority will need to demonstrate using robust evidence that the figure is based on realistic assumptions of demographic, demographic growth and that there are exceptional local circumstances that justify deviating from the standard method and this will be tested at examination. Uh, exceptional local circumstances will be called for so I bear in mind what Mr Justice Oosley said in the Compton case which Andrew's just been dealing with and um, of course that was in the context of exceptional circumstances required for Greenbelt release but it's interesting he said um, it's paragraph 74 if anyone would like the reference it's not necessary to explain why each factor or the combination is itself exceptional it does not mean that they have to be unlikely to recur in a similar fashion elsewhere they don't have to be unlikely to recur in a similar fashion elsewhere so i just uh, keep keep that in mind because i'll come back to that a bit later on uh, a recent example of the successful use of an alternative approach to the standard method was in the london legacy development corporation local plan review uh, the inspector agreed that exceptional circumstances did exist to justify using an alternative approach because the GLA's demographic projections for London were for the boroughs and not the development corporations and the LLDC had no nationally available data for its area so therefore it wasn't possible to use the standard method so the LLDC's OAN is 619 DPA as against the housing needs figure in the emerging London plan and also the identified capacity was limited in the in the LLDC's area especially when considered along with the need to prioritize land to provide uh, an effective employment base for the plan area as part of the Olympic legacy. There have of course been concerns about the standard method in particular about the uh, deallocation of land from the green belt in order to be able to plan for the required number of new homes especially in the home counties and there have been suggestions for uh, a different approach. For example, why not move away from uh, the use of household growth projections um, and focus instead on the scale of an area's housing market activity and the size of its housing stock and not household formations. And there's obvious potential uh, for that to make a lot more sense depending on uh, the longer term effects of COVID on the economy. But there is a lack of clarity at the moment. Uh, potential change of foot uh, review of the formula for calculating housing need has been promised earlier this year in, in March in the government's planning for the future paper that uh, includes a plan to review the formula for calculating housing need in order to encourage a greater building in urban areas um, one of the new tools to support communities to densify and make best use of their underutilized brownfield land Robert Jenrick said, we'll be reviewing our approach to planning to ensure our system enables more homes to come forward in the places that people most want to live, with jobs, with transport links and other amenities on their doorstep. This means making the best use of land and existing transport infrastructure. To that end, I'm announcing that we will review the formula for calculating local housing need, taking a fresh approach, which means building more homes, but encouraging greater building in urban areas so we'll see what that ends up meaning uh, he says we'll introduce a new approach which encourages greater building within and near to open areas and make sure the country is planning for the delivery of 300,000 new homes a year and that will be the second major change to the standard method since its introduction um, we uh, recalled that uh, the ministry said when uh, the uh, 2018 MPPF was published it would revise the standard method in expectation of the forthcoming ONS household projections that were anticipated to show a substantial drop in growth rates. The revised 2016 based projections published in September 2018 produced large drops in local housing need in many areas but then in 2018 the ministry announced that planners should ignore the latest figures when assessing their local housing need and instead use the 2014 based figures published two years earlier with a promise for the longer term to review the formula with a view to establishing a new method by the time the next projections are issued. And it said that the review should meet the principles, uh, including providing stability and certainty for local authorities and ensuring that planning responds not only to movements in projected households, but also to price signals. 
uh, there was a, a comment in March that uh, a plan for local housing need is only as good as the results it delivers uh, and they will introduce new changes to ensure that land sites and homes come forward on time and incentivize authorities to deliver more homes. Um, that includes, of course, uh, the new deadline now uh, for all local authorities to have an up-to-date local plan uh, by December 2023, continuing to drive supply through the housing delivery test. Of course, the presumption will now, uh, from November this year, apply to all authorities that have delivered less than 75% of their identified needs uh, and reforming the uh, new homes bonus to reward delivery. Just waiting for the slide to move on. Perhaps I could ask for some assistance there. It doesn't seem to be working at my end. Thank you very much. So the standard method is to be only departed from in exceptional circumstances. This is the NPPF 60, uh, just to remind ourselves again, to determine the minimum number of homes needed. Strategic policies should be informed by a local housing need assessment conducted using the standard method in national planning guidance, unless exceptional circumstances justify an alternative approach which also reflects current and future demographic trends and market signals. And the next slide please, I won't read the rest of that quote. Thank you. So as I said exceptional local circumstances will be needed to justify planning for a, a lower figure than that produced by the standard method. That's a paragraph 2A15 of the MPPG. So there needs to be something unusual about the local area which could not be repeated anywhere else around the country and that's why I, I lighted upon Mr Justice Oosley's comment in Compton because I thought well perhaps I'm wrong about that but I think context take care, takes care of that. He's obviously speaking very much about um, a, a specific matter of uh, justifying a uh, green belt release. So, so something unusual about the local area in my view which could not be simply repeated anywhere else around the country, something relevantly unusual such that in order to reflect the current and future demographic trends and market signals, uh, the language of uh, the, the MPPF, something should be done other than simply following the result of the application of the standard method. So the standard method is very much the safe zone and stepping outside effectively means demonstrating that it is not doing what it's meant to, in other words, identifying the need. Um, you may have seen representations, for example, by local green groups, which allege uh, exceptional local circumstances. And there's a need then to distinguish the extent to which those constitute a criticism of the standard method itself. Um, and of course, the examination in public isn't the forum for that. And it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of uh, judicial review and uh, people finding it hard to accept that the merits aren't relevant. It's sometimes hard. Um, for, for them to see that they're actually trying to sweep away the standard method uh, and it's no good just criticising it, they've got to actually look for these exceptional local circumstances. Thank you very much for listening, I think that's the end of the talks. Kate, uh, thank you very much indeed and thank you very much indeed to all the other panellists. We're now going to move on to uh, questions and answers. Well, answers mainly. Uh, so we have a good number of questions and we're not going to be able to answer them all. So I'm just going to select uh, ones which seem to have uh, stimulated the most interest. So I'm going to start off. We've got a question about uh, Regulation 35. Um, I'm afraid we're told we can't acknowledge the name of each uh, person who's posed a question, um, so they are anonymous, um, but very many thanks to all of you who have asked questions. And the question is about the requirements of Regulation 35 of the Local Planning Regulations, which is about availability of documents. And under Regulation 35.1, uh, a document is to be taken to be made available by a local planning authority when A, it's available for inspection, and B, published on the local planning authority's website. So it's A and B that have to be satisfied. And a number of questioners have asked, how do you satisfy A uh, if the local authority's offices are not open? Or even if they are open, um, how do people come in and inspect. Uh, Stephen, I think that's probably one for you because I think you set out 
Regulation 35 in your slides. Thank you, Neil. Yes, I did, because it, it is um, the part of the legislation that is causing local authorities problems, as recognised by the Planning Advisory Service, who basically say, yes, that's a problem. You know, you'll have to think about it. Um, and I think that's because the short answer is, um, because some of the other questions also raise this, is at the moment there, there isn't a way around it. You have to comply and satisfy that requirement. Um, so firstly, if you can't make the uh, document, and we're talking really here, Neil, it's probably well to make this clear again in light of another comment, that it applies to sec regulation 19, 22, 24, 25, 26. It doesn't apply to regulation 18, which is the earlier stage of the plan. Um, but if, if you can't make it available um, for inspection at the principal office, then I don't see how you comply with that. Someone asked whether, have, and I didn't really understand precisely the details, asked whether having it on a computer in the principal office would comply with that. And I wasn't sure whether they meant um, then someone looks at it online. And if it's that scenario, then I don't think you can, because I think that would be more within B. But if it means is someone's coming in into the office um, and they're cleaning the keyboard to, to comply with safety measures, then I, I don't think you have to have an actual paper document available in the office myself. I'd need to check the regulations, but I think it would be available if someone's sitting at a screen and reading. I don't know what you think, Neil, but I would have thought that that would satisfy it. But there, but there are still other issues if the offices aren't open and if they are open, keeping them clean. The, also, what troubles me, in addition to that, is, is the and, and what follows that, and at such other places within that area as the planning authority consider appropriate. Um, if the planning authority don't consider there are any appropriate, um, is that okay? Does that satisfy that requirement? Or do they have to find somewhere else? I mean, does, it, does the and mean there has to be somewhere, but they can consider where? And I don't know the answer to that, um, I don't know whether anyone else does, but I, I've not come across that. Um, I'm working with authorities are on the basis that once the main office opens, then they would be able to satisfy that, um, providing they can allow safe access. Um, Thank you, Stephen. Um, that uh, is helpful. Um, I'm going to move on to another question. Uh, one of the questioners asked about assumptions made uh, during the plan preparation process, and in particular, in relation to uh, the evidence base relating to viability and other matters. Um, and I'm gonna try a quick answer to this one. Uh, the answer is that in many cases, local authorities will have to review the assumptions which underlie the plan, uh, because viability considerations will have changed. And there's another slight twist on this in that it's made plain that sustainability appraisal is different from strategic environmental assessment, although they're usually dealt with in the same document. And that requires economic circumstances to be considered. So it may be necessary in the sustainability appraisal to have another look at economic circumstances. Um, but let's move on from that. Uh, one from which I think I'm going to pass to uh, James and this is a question about um, local green space and the questioner asks uh, could a neighbourhood development plan identify local green space on land already identified as green belt within the local planning authority's local plan? Uh, James. Um, thanks, Neil. So, yeah, so the, the simple answer to this is that um, the a, a neighbourhood plan certainly could um, designate in its neighbourhood plan land um, as local green space, which is already included in as green belt with, with the within the local plan. Um, the the designations are different and the tests are um, are different. As you know, um, the, the, the um, LGS designation should only be used where the green space is 
uh, reasonably close proximity to the community, demonstrably special um, and holds particular local um, uh, significance um, and uh, is local in character. So they, those are the tests in paragraph 100 of the MPPS. Um, the, I, I, I suppose it's a, it's a different question as to whether you would, um, you would really need to or whether it, it, it's absolutely necessary because of course um, paragraph 101 of the MPPF says that um, the way you should manage uh, development within a local green space in, in essence has to be consistent with the way you manage uh, development within the green belt and that's that set out of paragraph 101. Um, I think the the same question of um, the same person that raised that particular question also said what happens if um, that land then comes out of the green belt in the local plan um, or in a subsequent um, iteration of local plan does it still remain as local green space well it certainly would in the neighborhood plan um, and I'd say that they are they are to um, that say that there was nothing, there's nothing to stop that designation in, in, in Euring, for, for want of a better term, in the neighbourhood plan. Um, the, 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 to the extent that there's any conflict, um, then of course you, you'd have to look at um, the, the sort of last to be adopted rule under section 38.5 of the Planning Compulsory Purchase Act. But I think the argument would be, well, there's no actual conflict because they're separate designations. Um, so, the um, so I hope I hope that answers um, the question for uh, that, that that's been raised. Um, I mean, I, I I think there is there are issues with the way local green spaces um, is being used in neighbourhood plans, and I I know there's been a few a uh, few other questions about that. Um, and one one observation has been made. Of course, it's perfectly reasonable for um, neighbourhood uh, plan uh, makers to want to use. A local green space um, but it is it is in circumstances where they're concerned about green belt boundaries being diminished but of course it, it does impose a fairly stringent well there's a very stringent test at paragraph 100 which has to be um, looked at in some detail should you want to proceed with that sort of designation I hope that answers the yes, question. Much, yes. so let's move from uh local green space and green belt to green belt and a question which I'm going to direct to you Andrew if I may and that is a question uh, the following question is asked what are the implications of para 138 that's 138 in the MPPF which re requires compensatory improvements um, Andrew your view on that um, thank you, Neil, and, and thanks for the question, because I, I think it is um, a very important issue. So um, I'll just quickly read out um, the relevant bit of paragraph 138. It says local planning authorities should also set out ways in which the impact of removing land from the green belt can be offset through compensatory improvements to the environmental quality and accessibility of remaining green belt land. Um, and in, in terms of the language there, I think two, two things. Firstly, um, the compensatory, uh, the land where the compensatory measures um, uh, should be introduced doesn't need to be immediately adjacent to the land that's been removed, but it does need to be um, within the green belt. But perhaps more importantly, this is um, written in fairly mandatory terms. They should set out measures. So it's not a we're necessary or we're appropriate. Um, I know, for example, the St Albans plan um, one of the reasons it came unstuck was the inspector didn't consider that this had been adequately considered. Um, there is guidance in the PPG on this. It sets out the types of compensatory improvements that you can have. Uh, for example, woodland planting, biodiversity improvements, um, new walking and cycle routes, and says that it should be um, secured through conditions section 106 or SIL. In terms of what this is likely to mean in practice, I think there's, there's two or three um, implications. I mean, the, the first issue is for local pl planning authorities in terms of how, how to grapple with this. Um, to my mind, the most obvious way would be through the Greenbelt Review, um, which is a key part of the evidence base in any event for Greenbelt release. Um, and that would seem to be the logical place to identify 
um, suitable land for uh, compensatory measures to be um, introduced, um, bearing in mind the purposes of the green belt and, and how um, those measures might come forward. I think for developers demonstrating that your site can contribute to um, the types of compensatory measures set out in paragraph 138 will be key um, because ultimately this is going to form part of the exceptional circumstances uh, test at a local level so if you can demonstrate that you can provide this then that will assist um, and that might lead to um, um, land ownership complications so obviously if you, if you own the um, adjacent land and that's in the green belt then that's great but i can see that this could give rise to ransom situations where owners hold land in the green belt uh, that isn't being released but is appropriate for compensatory measures and of course that um, in the long term could could give rise to viability concerns and then finally the only other point i'd, I'd add is that the land where these um, measures are being um, added is likely to be um, become more prized and less likely in the longer term to subsequently be released in any uh, future green belt review um, so again if you're a developer looking to um, uh, secure release of your your site um, it may be sensible not to um, allow it to be used for compensatory measures because that could make it more difficult for it be, for it to be released in the future thanks andrew um Kate, one for you, I think. Uh, somebody has asked about uh, the latest household projections. The 2018 household projections are due to be released later this month. Uh, when do you think we may get a direction from MHCLG on the potential use of those projections, um, particularly if they don't uh, add up to the 300,000 that the government set on? And do we go on using the 2014 uh, figures for the purposes of the standard method uh, for the time being? Mm. Do, I'm actually particularly interested in this because I was instructed to appear at a local plan examination. We prepared all our papers and then we were suddenly hit with the 2016 projections, um, which didn't give us the answers we wanted. Um, Kate, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Very good question. I, I think in terms of when we're likely to get a direction from the Ministry on uh, whether to use the 2018 projections or uh, indeed about any change to the standard method formula, uh, probably the same answer as when we're going to get our uh, planning white paper, which I know people have been asking about uh, as, as well. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, certainly continue to use the 2014 projections unless advised otherwise. Um, in, in view of what the MPPG says about uh, if you don't do that, then you won't be seen to be following the standard method. So, so yes, I agree with the question. Keep, keep with the 2014 projections for the time being. Thank you. I don't think we're going to have time to answer many more questions. There's one other one that I would be interested in the views of the panel on, which uh, one of the questioners points to a district council that has adopted an interim policy for housing delivery for immediate use. And it appears that it hasn't gone through the plan making process. And the questioner asks, is this a safe way to proceed and how much weight will be given to this interim policy, especially as it's not been subject to sustainability appraisal and it could be added strategic environmental assessment. Well, the immediate problem that this type of policy comes up against is the requirement in the 2004 Act that policies uh, have to be set out in local development documents, section 17, subsection 3. And this seems to me to be a risky uh, process for a local authority to follow. Equally, uh, decision makers, the local authority, but also potentially inspector, is going to have to grapple with how much weight, if any, do you give to such an interim policy? So I think it is fraught with danger. Uh, do others have views on that? Neil, can I comment? Yes. Um, I agree with you. I, I, my immediate reaction was little, if any, weight. I mean, without knowing the full facts, one needs to be careful. It, 
as per normal, whether it reflects some other adopted policy, but surely in principle, for the reasons you said, it would be given a little, if any. And I agree with the at all. difficulties. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anybody else got a view on that? Oh, I, I agree. I mean, the, this this issue um, comes up. Um, I see, see people trying to um, shoehorn into supplementary planning guidance uh, material that's more appropriate for um, local plan documents. And I'm. Um, it, it seems that it's as the frustration with the local plan process increases and delays, you, the local planning authorities are trying to do that a bit more. But um, that it's pretty clear you can't for the precise reasons you say, um, Neil, um, under 17.3. It's actually quite strict what is a, a local plan policy or not that should um, go through that process. Thank you very much. Well, I think I'd like to thank all our panellists for um, uh, the work and thought that went into each presentation and the interesting and useful insights. Can I also thank all of you who've attended, for attending, and particularly those who asked questions. I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer all of them, but I hope that we have answered a good representative sample. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you will sign in for future landmark webinars and that you found this webinar useful. Thank you very much. Bye.